Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesha Nikolic and my guest today is Fiona White. Fiona is a professor in social psychology, and she graduated with a PhD from the University of Sydney in 1997. Her research expertise concerns the development of effective strategies to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion. She has led many prejudice and stigma reduction projects involving contact and recategorization strategies and has received competitive funding from the Australian Research Council, Office of Learning and Teaching, and also Vic Health. She is currently the director of the Sydney University Psychology of Intergroup Relations Research Lab. And today she's here to talk about strategies to promote uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and some fascinating research that she's been doing with regards to how contact between groups can go out and reduce these uh, equity and, and inclusion factors, you know, promote them and, and reduce stigma and uh, racism and the like. Very refreshing conversation. An absolute pleasure to speak with Fiona and I enjoyed it immensely and I'm sure you will and have and also get some practical applications about how you can potentially bring some of these ideas into your own workplace or even, even in your life. So enjoy. Fiona, a big thank you for coming on to the show today. Thank you, Nesh, for inviting me. Look, I'm really interested to, to further this conversation that I've had with some of your peers and obviously my peers as well, you know, in the space of you know, equality, diversity, inclusion, you know, how we make a better, a better world. I know that obviously this area has uh, gotten a lot of attention of late, which I think is 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 excellent. At the same time, you know there are some challenges that this space holds mm-hmm. because many of us can be quite um, uh, idealistic in how the world can be, and yet it, it, it's it's a challenge to to try and achieve these things. So I'm hoping I can maybe find out more about your research and and you know extend on that and find out how do we how do we integrate this into into the real world um you know so that we achieve these results yeah and and like you real world applications that's really what drives me um being an academic sometimes we can get stuck with writing peer publications for our colleagues but we really need to translate we need to be better translators and communicators of our research so but this applied research can actually be impactful in schools and the workplace and places like that. Do you mind maybe uh, talking me through and, and, and our listeners into some of your research where you've you know focused most? What um, you know what sort of interest you've had in this space? Because obviously it's fairly diverse. And it is. It um, is. I'm, I'm sure that there are some little passion pieces that that you hold. There is. So I guess uh, I've been working in this space for about thirty years now. Um, and being a, a woman and being a woman of colour, I actually have a, a cultural background. I was born in Sri Lanka and I came here in 1971 with mum and dad. Um, and the, the funny thing is, is that, you know, my colour of my skin is brownish, but my surname is white. And that used to always be kind of the, 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 the target of quite a few jokes in the playground. Why aren't you Fiona Brown? Why aren't you Fiona Black? You know, and I used to laugh along with it and I thought it was quite funny. Um, and, you know, that it didn't really impact me in the 70s and 80s. I have to say, growing up in the suburb that I did in Sydney, it was very multicultural. Um, the school I went to was multicultural. My friends were from all sorts of different cultures. And, um, you know, I have to say... At a personal level, I didn't feel like I was a target of any kind of blatant racism or anything like that. 
But the funny and the irony of being what I call this counter stereotype of having brown skin but having a surname of white was it kind of continued. And even to this day, if I have new staff or new students knocking on my door and they see, you know, Professor Fiona White on the door, they still open the door and say, oh, is Fiona here? Um, and, and expecting to see someone probably who might look different to what they, you know, would stereotype the name of white to look like. So that kind of still continues. And it was that really implicit kind of subtle form of, of judgment that I think became a real interest to me as a scholar because, you know, uh, we have been through various evolutions of blatant forms of racism and things like that and and very much started my interest as an undergrad really in my social psychology lectures, being a social psychologist, learning about this professor in America called Gordon Allport. And in 1954, Allport wrote this famous um, a text called The Nature of Prejudice, which I actually have on my shelf here. And it's a very thick book, um, as you can see. Uh, but in Chapter 16, there's this really brief reference um, to how society can reduce prejudice. And this is what he writes. He writes, prejudice, unless deeply rooted in the character structure of the individual, may be reduced by equal status, that was one of his conditions, between the majority and minority groups in the pursuit of a common goal. And the effect is greatly enhanced, this reduction is, if the contact is sanctioned by the institution that supports it, and provided it is of a sort that leads the perception of common interests and common humanity between members of the two groups. And that's all in that big book that all Port wrote about reducing prejudice. And in from 1954 to 2023, social psychologists have kind of extracted that paragraph and, and, and talked about these four conditions to reduce prejudice and improve equality um, improved diversity and things like that. But what I found as an academic, both as an undergrad, then as a postgrad, and now working in this area, is very few social psychologists spent their time trying to operationalise those four conditions of equal status, common goals, support from authority, cooperation, to reduce prejudice in an in an experimental way. They talked about it, they asked self-reports about it, they gave questionnaires about it, but no one actually manipulated it to see, are these four conditions really important for equality? And so that's really where I kind of came in with my research. And I really, if anything, I identify as a social psychologist that comes up with interventions and strategies to reduce prejudice. Um, and that could be racial prejudice, it could be sexual prejudice, it could be sexual minority prejudice, it could be mental health stigma, which I've also done research on. And so any sorts of these negative evaluations. And I guess in my intro, I also talked about this real interest in this subtle modern form. And that's because I think, you know, with legislation, things like that, with the post-civil rights movement, you know, this kind of blatant maybe, you know, racist slurs, these overt kinds of prejudice maybe have subsided a little in our society, but this kind of modern subtle form, this reluctance to be positive towards another cultural group member or another gender or a, a sexual minority or someone with a mental health issue, you know, what that subtlety, you know, that lack, lack of positivity, what, what does that do to that individual? Well, the research shows that whether you are a target of this kind of blatant form of prejudice or this new modern subtle form where there's this reluctance to be positive, that psycho-emotionally the impact is the same. And so this is kind of, again, you know, increasing my interest in this area, this more modern, subtle form, and what we can do as academics. So two real things instigated my interest. First of all, Allport's little paragraph, or that lack of social psychologists doing any kind of experimental work to manipulate those variables, and then also this more a new, nuanced, modern form of kind of prejudice that's emerging in our society that kind of, I guess, makes it really tricky for us psychologists, whether we're social psychologists, clinical sites, to, to, to show, you know, how do you explain to someone 
oh, I felt targeted. I felt excluded. I wasn't invited to that meeting at the workplace. I wasn't invited to lunch. I wasn't given that mentoring opportunity. I'm not quite sure why. I can't think of why that I was excluded, but there's a sense it might have something to do with either my my culture, my my gender, my religion, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit more about what this this more nuanced modern version or form of prejudice uh, is and, and how we might uh, measure that? Because I, I think all of us are so, so well, you know, in tune of saying what, you know, uh, very di- direct prejudice looks like. And, and mm. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that um, in most cases people have been able to moderate the way that they've you know, behave and and I think based on that maybe even start to change their viewpoints you know S- similarly though uh, being a highly multicultural society also means that we um, uh, have lots of migrants that come in as well who have you know different cultures that they've come from and it's not necessarily even always how we view them it's often how they you us you know as though there's a separation you know it's like mm-hmm. you know us versus mm-hmm. the migrants or you know mm-hmm. their culture versus ours mm-hmm. so there's this huge separation when we are multicultural it's kind of like a place where everyone can be and i mean certainly growing up and as a young person i have a you know a, a serbian heritage mm-hmm. um, if i look at the viewpoints that my parents held once upon a time versus the viewpoints that they hold now. And I'd like to say that's probably true for all people in their 30s. You know, by the time they get to their 70s, they uh, have different viewpoints, but it, they can be dramatically different. And and some of those could have been, um, or and were, um, and I'd like to put my hand up as well, that you know, some of my viewpoints were incredibly racist mm-hmm. um, and, 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 you know, in many forms, you know, and sexist and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. So it's something sure. that we have to kind of contend with. Yeah. Uh, can you talk us through a little bit about this, this modern nuanced yeah. form and, and how we so kind of measure it? Nesh, it might come under different terms in the literature or in newspapers, but really what this modern, it's, it can also be called subtle prejudice. It can be called um, covert prejudice. It's kind of underlying and it's not obvious. And it might, like I said, just be this reluctance to promote positivity. And when I say reluctance to be positive, like the, the blatant forms, you know, overtly negative, right, towards a certain group. But this modern form is let's just hold back on that positivity. Let's just hold back on that praise that's really deserving. Let's just hold back on that promotion that is really important and probably you know, should have happened five years ago. Let's just kind of not invite you to that that mentoring workshop or that that lunch where there's a lot of social networking that might occur. But even amongst kids in the playground, um, we talk about multicultural Australia, but I still think there's huge areas, Nesh, in, in, in Australia that I call multicultural segregation. And, and there's still multiple cultures, but a lack of integration. And that's because multiculturalism as a policy stands as a policy rather than as an active implementation of it. And so I think, you know, um, governments, politicians, educators, psychologists, academics could do more in that space. And, and, you know, I'm trying to make a a point of that. Uh, Interestingly, I I was on an ABC documentary called The School That Tried to End Racism. Um, and it was really um, a very exciting documentary and it, it won several awards and was nominated for several awards. But what we focused on in that documentary were year five and year six children and they were going to a multicultural school. And what I noticed at lunchtime, I said, oh, can I just go and have an observation at lunchtime as to what these, these children might be doing in, in the school playground at lunchtime, very multicultural. But, you know, what I still saw was what you just said, and that is we're still quite separated. We still kind of feel a little bit more comfortable amongst our own cultural group. And that's understandable, right, that we feel comfort there. Um, And so that was what I was observing amongst these kids, that in the classroom there was kind of integration, but at lunchtime when they had their own opportunities or agencies to choose their friendship groups they were kind of sticking with their own cultural groups and so what we were able to do in this 
this three-week program was to kind of break that cycle and, and get them to say, oh, look, there's no anxiety to talk to somebody else and find out about themselves. And again, we use really practical interventions in that program, evidence-based interventions to really encourage students to just feel a little bit more confident or what I call have contact efficacy, so a confidence to have contact with another group member um, and have a conversation. That really spurred on these different friendship groups. And by the end of the series, you'll see that there's all these new friendship groups that have kind of emanated because of these really conscious interventions. It, it is interesting that we have a tendency, and I'm, I'm assuming that there's some sort of biological, evolutionary sort hard of... Hardwiring, um, yeah. You know, hardwiring or, or explanation that we kind of go towards those that, you know, look alike, speak alike, you know, like interests yeah. uh, and all, all those sorts of things. And just reflecting on my own life, I, you know, even though I was just a child, I have no idea what, you know, uh, uh, any of these things mean. But, yeah. you know, as a, as a young uh, a kid you know being serbian all of a sudden I, I connect with you know this serbian sort of context yeah. and that that means that you, the, you therefore don't like croatians right because there's a war going on so Correct. you know you must hate them and then yes. you know the rest yes. of the kids go well yes. maybe the serbian boys can fight the the, the yes. croatian yes. boys right yes. and yes. Yes. you all agree and you, yes. you, you, yes. you you know you act like fools yes. um but it's it's fascinating because obviously later on in life at least for me um, not obviously, but later on in life, I somewhat rejected the mm. my heritage, you know, mm. and I didn't want mm. anything to do with, you know, mm. Serbian people and mm. I thought that was all foolish and I wanted to kind of get away from it, you know, so mm. I rejected my my roots mm. um, and, you know, I think I'd probably say in the last 10 or, or, or so years now, um, I really feel strongly connected and maybe that's because i've got children now and yes, I, I i see the value yes, of that yes, and then yes, how yes. my children get to see my wife's heritage my heritage yes. um uh, and and you know they're, they're kind of serbian slash polish slash yes. you know probably Beautiful. mainly aussie but uh, <laughs> yeah, i like yeah. to give them lots of yes. flavoring from, yeah, from, yeah, uh, from yeah, europe yeah. but it's really fascinating and and it's it it's interesting uh, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about some of those interventions in in, in you know, the school that tried to end racism, uh, how you went about trying to break some of those barriers or, you know, the exposure for kids to to examine these things because, you know, it, it, it can be strange. And, you know, even as a human being, it's almost it's kind of like hard when someone passes away. You're like, I don't know what words to say. You know, we've all felt that, you know, what, what do you say when someone passes away or when someone's gone through a hard time? And it might be a similar sort of a, a, a function that's at play where it's maybe I don't know what to say to someone of color or maybe I don't know what to say to someone of, you know, a different visual appearance or a language or something that, you know, needs to be um, addressed or, or at least looked at. Yeah, and I think that's another overlap between what you do and what I do. I mean, I, I really think prejudice and, and and subsequent racism, if that is what happens, is kind of cognitive behaviour change. And so a lot of my behaviours and my interventions target, oh, we can think differently if we're given the skills. We can behave differently if we're given the skills, if we're given the tools to, to act differently. And that's what we need to do as a society is provide, you know, children with these tools so that they can take those tools into adolescence and then take them into adulthood, right? And so I really think early intervention is the best prevention. Like anything that you and I do, that's that's the saying, right? And it doesn't, it does, it holds true for the area of prejudice and equality and, and racism as well. Let's get in there early and give um, these children the tools. And so what we tended to focus on there is very much evidence-based social psychology interventions. Like I said, contact. That's Gordon Allport's construct that I spoke about earlier, and that's intergroup contact that's cooperative, equal, has a goal attached to it. So they, they need to achieve something together, Nesh, that they can't achieve alone. So it's not addressing, and this is the biggest problem, I think, in a lot of prejudice research. They just target one group. And prejudice is an intergroup phenomenon. Racism is an intergroup phenomenon. It involves two groups. So the interventions really need to have both groups involved. That's challenging. That's hard. 
Um, but that's really the most effective strategy. Um, and so what I really try to do in this program and other interventions I do, all of my interventions have a minority group, and whether that be the cultural, racial, gender, um, uh, mental health uh, person uh, versus the majority, and that's, you know, um, working together in a conversation. So all of my contact interventions aren't targeting one or the other, but it's an intergroup contact with all of all ports conditions involved. And even on this um, school that tried to end racism, we created these uh, cardboard cutouts of, their, of, of friends in their, in their classroom. So these are kids that were actually in their classroom, but they weren't interacting with, right? They were only in the classroom with them, but they weren't socially interacting with them at lunchtime, little lunch or after school. It was just classroom. So what I did was, or what we did as, as an intervention, we, we developed these classroom cardboard cutouts and students were paired with another culturally different person to them as a cardboard cutout. And, and they took these cardboard cutouts home and they found out information about their culture. Because when we find out information about, you know, what do Serbians like to eat? You know, what is their food? Um, what are some of their rituals? What are their religions? Um, we go, oh, that's a little bit like me or that's a little bit different to me. But there's some overlap, there's some difference. But we're learning. And by learning, we're breaking down barriers, yeah? And and these cardboard cutouts, so I call it extended contact because they weren't the real person, sure. but they were, a, you know, a precursor, a preparatory step for the real contact. Gave these, these young kids so much confidence to then go and speak to the real friend in the classroom the next day and talk about their culture. So it's just breaking the cycle. And then once people, young kids, us, we get used to difference, we're okay with it. But we avoid difference because of the fear, initial fear, but we just need to break that, that, that anxiety um, through initial kind of step-by-step -step stages of getting contact and, and cooperation together. So contact is a real, I mean, if I think about it from a psychological perspective, you know, contact is is the the real form of exposure right that that we are whether it's an anxiety or you know whether it's you know being being isolated whatever it is is actually going and facing you know a fear or it might not even be fear it just might be you know unfamiliarity and if you contact it if you if, if you have a connection there that it's obviously much more powerful than just thinking differently because you 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 viscerally feel it and the thinking goes along with that. And it's very, very hard to dispute something that you have experienced as being right. positive. So all of a sudden you can have a connection yeah. um, that is far beyond just thinking about it um, and not suggesting that thinking isn't valuable because we, we know that from a CBT model yes. um, and, you know, all of psychology, we do need to to think about it. Having said that, there is something incredibly valuable about the action phase you know where where you do make contact and and also the contact like you know all put says needs to be cooperative so mm. what are we what are we contacting for oh what are we trying to achieve together oh are we making a pasta dish together um are we coming up with a solution to save the environment like a water saving solution together these are really good interventions for school kids because climate change is at the forefront of children's minds it's not at the forefront of adults minds where it should be but it is at the forefront of our children's minds you know and 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 so let's really as psychologists target things that could be common and achievable goals and get these two groups to work together on a solution towards mm. those goals because there's so much that we can offer one another if we just work together and that's why two groups coming together is so important in my strategy it's not just saying going to the you know the white majority heterosexual male and saying you need to change your thinking that's not at all that's too that's mm. simplistic it's not going to work it's short term Termism. We don't want to do that. It's much more strategic, much more nuanced, much more evidence-based and much more theory-based. I really like the goal-orientated feature of, of um, Gordon Allport's sort of uh, perspective because that brings in that whole concept, at least for me, I'm hearing it yes. as adversity. You know, when, when there's a challenge that yes. needs to be met and you have yes. to do that as a group because it's not a single uh, person that can do it. You have to have all members, um, you know, uh, cooperating to then 
overcome the adversity, you bond. You know, there's a strong bond that that comes from getting it, getting through a challenge. And and I I have to believe that that's also there's something evolutionary in that as well. Yeah, that if you've yeah. gone through hard times together, yeah. you connect. You know, you can rely on that person. And and likewise, you know, that trust is is reciprocated as well. Yeah, I'll tell you a story about that. It's very visceral that 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 achieving a common goal. I in I think 2012, I, I conducted this longitudinal study involving um, segregated uh, Muslim school in Sydney and um, a, a Christian school in Sydney. So they were we still have religious segregation in some schools in Sydney. And so um, what I wanted to do was introduce this this contact premise of mine. And um, they were year sevens, year eights, and year nine. So what I went in, I looked at them in year seven, and I said connected them via the internet so they didn't physically meet but they synchronously met Nesh via this kind of chat tool that I set up and they had this 10-week curriculum where they had to come up with energy saving water saving recycling solutions which was the common goal and what I found was that the I then followed those students from when they were in year seven to year eight to year nine. So it was a three-year longitudinal intervention. And what I found was that these students that were in the intergroup contact conditions, so the Muslim and the Christian students coming up with their environmental solutions over 10 weeks, their religious bias towards one another reduced significantly at three months, six months post-intervention, and then 12 months. So when they were in year nine, when these same students progressed and graduated to year nine, their biases were maintained, their bias reduction was maintained um, toward the other group compared to the control group that just spoke intra-groups, so Muslims and Muslims, Christians and Christians, so the standard curriculum. So what we showed was even when there's not face-to-face contact, e-contact or the construct I've developed, which is electronic contact, you know, really worked. And I was giving this lecture only last year, so what, 10 years later, and a student came up to me after the lecture and said, oh, Fiona, I was in that that Muslim Christian intervention when I was, you know, in, in high school, and I still remember coming up with this water-saving solution with my Christian friends on how whether we were Muslim or Christian, we would still have to maintain the Australian environment. That was our common identity and that was our common goal, and I still remember what we came up with. So that goal was visceral 10 years later to this student, and I think that was one of my... Okay, I've done it in in psychology now. It's made my my day and my life, and you know, it really was probably one of the, the the touchstone moments of my career when someone comes up to you and remembers something from a decade ago. So yeah, it was great. What was the what was that reduction after the the the, the e contact? I'm I'm interested because I actually remember it was a long long time ago <laughs> now where I observed uh, I watched a it was like a documentary or a show yeah. where. Yeah. They brought Israeli and Palestinian kids together, right. um, and you know they they spent a short period of time. And upon separation, I can feel myself getting sort of uh, you know emotionally sort of pulled yes. into this because the, the 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 kids were crying when they were separated. Right, so they, these were kids that you know initially they were quite uh, apprehensive you know how's it going to be probably all the stories they've heard from from mum and dad, and yeah. and then they ended up being kids right and and they played with each other and they had challenges together and they discussed lots of things together and and it, you know they forged beautiful loving friendships right and then when they separated these kids um they you know uh, uh, you know you'd see this this great sort of you know grief and hardship of of you know I'm going to lose my friend you know I'm probably never going to see them again and um and they did a follow up on it and I know some of the kids maintained this open-mindedness and, and and kind of understanding that it was had a huge impression on them and others sadly um, probably had less of an of an affect but you know there would be individual cases and I'm sure this show wanted to show both as examples both ends, or, yeah um, but what was the, the 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 sort of reduction that you found in your research so we was very much quantitative. Um, we it was you know um, Australian Research Council grant research, so there's got to be quantitative changes. So there's a scale that I developed called the Cultural Issues Scale, and it's also the scale that I um, used in the school that tried to end racism. So 
it's a, a scale mesh where they look at all these, these different blatant and subtle um, scenarios of either racism or religious prejudice and they've got to rank how serious that issue is on that scale so it's not one of these you know Likert sort of scales that agree or disagree because I think like Likert scales kind of make you pro- want to provide socially desirable responses because of this word agree or disagree right so I wanted to change it up so I said read the scenario and rate how serious it was. And I kind of put blatant examples, you know, yelling racial slurs because of the headwear that they had on. Um, How serious is that? And then I would put um, another kind of more subtle modern uh, scenario of, um, you know, uh, someone was served at the shop um, before the Muslim student or the Muslim individual in the shop, even though the Muslim person was there first. Um, how serious is that? And, and again, what I want and what I expect is whether it's subtle or blatant that they're all really extremely serious, um, because we know the research says that that you're if you're the target of that, you feel equally psycho emotionally affected and impacted. And what and what you can tell from that sort of scale is whether these kids have become more perceptive at detecting bias and protect, detecting the subtle form, which is really what I want them to do. The blatant one is pretty obvious, but the subtle one is the one that I want them to start to learn to detect through this intervention. And what I notice is after three months, after six months and after 12 months, they were all much better detectors of this subtle racism and they were able to maintain that understanding of it at that long-term kind of follow-up. So it was very much a quantitative measure. There were also other scales that I used, like visuals, like of um, mosques and churches and asking asking them to evaluate their, their feelings towards these images. So it was called the image effective scale because, you know, I was thinking of what, what would make students interested in this research, not filling out all these questionnaires, but more visual kind of stimuli. So that was more an effective measure. So I wanted to look, to, you know, measure affect, so emotion, um, cognition, which was the, the discrimination kind of cultural issue scale and and those sorts of measures. And I also asked them, who would you like to be friends with your colleagues that you've met for the for this 10 week um, intervention in the future and to talk about that and how they would like to meet? So I got some qualitative information as well and that was informative because I was made aware to the to the teachers as you're saying that some students really would have wanted to maintain that contact beyond the intervention but it was also up to here we go the 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 hurdle was up to parents to allow that interaction to occur because these parents had decided to send their kids to religiously segregated schools so there was complexity there but there was this opportunity for students if they wanted to share email addresses and things like that to do so but it had to be parental permission um, because of the ages involved you know what that's just sparked in me we often talk about as as, as psychologists and 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 you know uh, and and related fields we all we all talk about you know in medicine alike early intervention and this has just sparked something in me of saying wait a second maybe maybe we've all got it wrong Maybe it's actually j- just uh, consistent intervention, mm. right, across all boards. Because mm. uh, yes, w- you know, it's very useful to go out and, and, and work with young people like that. That 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 would never be debated. Um, but maybe it's equally as as valuable. Uh, and we know this in actual fact with with working with kids is the more time a psychologist spends with the parents, the better the therapeutic outcome. So it's actually not necessarily moderated with time with the child. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, younger children yeah, yeah, in yeah, particular. Yeah, yeah. It's actually moderated by the amount of time the psychologist spends yeah. with the parents. Yeah. And and so there's research that, that goes out and says, you know, we, we would suggest spend as much time as you can with the parents, you know, in supporting the child. Now, as a good psychologist, you still need to spend time with the child to understand them, their needs, their perspectives, mm-hmm. where they're coming from, do work, you know, do some work, sure. which is both behavioral and, and cognitive in nature. But as you say, like in this intervention that you're talking about with your longitudinal study, some of it is 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 so much moderated in terms of contact opportunity um, okay. by the parents, right? Correct. By the environment and, and a school in 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 fact that has segregated sort of learning. 
the contact there by by the pure nature of the design is really narrow. Um, and, and, and so we know that, um, you know, prejudices, which you know, are going to be unhelpful period across the board in, in, in the modern world, you know, maybe if, if we were, you know, a thousand years ago, it might be valuable because maybe it actually worked. Maybe prejudices were so high on both sides that they would just kill each other. And then yeah. you, you better hold that because yeah. otherwise you will be yeah. killed. Yeah. Not in the modern world, no. not, not today's standard. So may, maybe this idea of early intervention is, that is could be, you know, um, uh, 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 further developed to, you know, consistent intervention or, or across the board intervention or something that yes, still targets young. Uh, we do need that, but the generational change is way too long. You know, yes. I know we need it, but but yeah. uh, we've yeah. got to be, especially like young parents. Like, I think young parents can be incredibly impressionable as well. They're still young, mm-hmm. like like you know, young doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, uh, from seven years old to to you know eighteen or something. No, no. Um, we could go out and say young in a lifespan. You know, that, you know. Uh, because we're going to all live, you know, at least say, uh, statistically to 80, right? 80, so, yeah, sure. Um, maybe early intervention means the 30-year-old parents, you know, or the 40-year-old, you know, um, well-established, you know, in their career, you know, adults. Yeah, and you're right, Nish. Look, in, in the ideal world, in my little utopian world, it is kind of multi-pronged, <clears> isn't it? It's intervention for the child, for the teacher and, and, and for the, the parents. Because when I go to schools, because I think my my ambition now is to make, you know, anti-racism kind of part of the, the national curricula, right? Just to, even if it's not within the the sit-down classroom lessons, it's it's online curriculum that they need to still um, watch or hear and engage in after school, okay? So even if teachers and principals say, oh, no, Fiona, we can't fit it in the curriculum, it's too full, I'm, I'm, I've always got my comeback. Well, let's make it a, a piece of an online module that they have to do. And, and as you said, consistently. So from K to 12, you know, there is this kind of um, degree of some sort of learning, appropriate cognitive learning for that age group that sits on an online platform for um, year, you know, K to 12. So that's that's kind of my my ambition now um, is to make it consistent um, and have parents because it's online they can access this content as well right maybe we could even make that content for parents and for students and for the kids to work together to achieve a goal together which is to reduce some form of prejudice that we want to target so um, this these are all of my thoughts where my next steps are because you're right. You know, after that beautiful intervention and after three years of hard work, you know, the school kind of went back, the schools went back to teaching their their normal curriculum. Um, uh, parents probably undid some of the work, some of the, the less broad-minded parents that we achieved. Um, so, yes, I'm aware it's multi-pronged. And when I go to, I do a lot of consultancies with schools and, and they might have me come in and, and develop programs for those schools and what they'll tell me the teachers, oh, but Fiona, when they go home, it's all undone. Um, and I said, no, but you know what we're doing? We're still inoculating them. And and in a way they might be able to say to mum and dad, well, actually, this is what I learned. And so there might be some open communication at that, at that dinner table, at dinner time as to what happened at school that wouldn't happen if we didn't have this program. So I kind of give the teachers a lift up and say, no, this is still good. This is still important. Um, yes, it's not perfect, but it's still an important thing to be talking about with, with students because I really see prejudice and discrimination as what I call the social virus niche because it's insidious. It can't mm. be it can't be viewed under a microscope. You can't have a vaccine for it. Uh, it's a pandemic. It's global, but there's it's so insidious because unless I tell you, I feel I'm a target of some form of prejudice. You're relying on me telling you that and and you believing me. And that that's a very difficult situation to address. Maybe there's some value also in, in how we talk about it because I think sometimes people can switch off uh, when terms are used so commonly. Like, you know, for example, in psychology, this idea of, you know, mindfulness 
uh, you know, although it's a wonderful um, uh, tool and has incredible value and, and, and the like, sadly it's been reported on so many times in, in, in magazines in, in a poor way that people say, oh, yeah, I, I know what that is when they don't. Yeah. Um, you know, and same thing with, you know, this kind of idea of, you know, things that, that, that target anti-racism, you know, people can go, oh, okay, here we go again, yeah. you know, and in some sense, what we're trying to do is emphasizing, embracing diversity through contact, you know, where, where, where it's not necessarily, you know, a formal course on anti-racism where, where we're looking at diversity and celebrating diversity yeah. through, yeah. you know, goal orientated, you know, challenges that require cooperation which is the contact and then having a, a positive outcome and so kids yeah. won't necessarily even know or parents won't even necessarily know that they are doing that you know exactly uh, they are actually just integrating it as they go through it exactly Nash. correct nail on the head again this is what and we're, and we're creating uh, a future student sample with agency, you know, with efficacy in this area. They've got confidence. So they're not going to avoid now like you and I might have when we were young. They, they taught the skills. They've got the tools now because we've educated them that way. And so, yes, it's all of that. Um, and it has to be ongoing. And I really am not a, I don't like, I mean, anti-racism, I, I hear bandied a, a lot. And that's coming, I think, more from a sociological um, lens, whereas I try to use the word racism reduction because I'm actually changing the behaviour. I'm not just. Mm. Being, I think we're all anti-racist. That's the problem with anti-racism. We're all against racism, but what do we do about it? So I'm yes. about doing. I'm about changing attitudes and behaviours and having social psychology evidence-based reduction interventions, which isn't anti-racism. It's reducing racism. So that's where I put my different lens on, and I really distinguish myself from that kind of terminology because it's really not what I do I think we're all anti-racist so um not all of us but the majority are but we don't do anything about it and 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 I think it's about what you and I try to do in our daily lives is change people's thinking and behavior for the better that's really what you and I share that's our common goal that you and I have and um in in fact I even had this um clinical psychology PhD student once looking into prejudice as something that could be susceptible to clinical interventions you know uh, through change of cognition and behavior so it there is a lot of overlap between what we do um uh, but I, I, you do it on that kind of one-on-one -on -one basis I try to do it on the the big kind of data scale or group intervention of like a 20-person classroom or um, a workplace, I go to workplaces, because you just said it, it's not about diversity, it's diversity with cooperation and with inclusion. You, it, diversity alone is like multiculturalism alone. Everyone's segregated, yes, we're diverse, but no one's integrating or connecting or contacting. So we need contact, we need inclusion, and we need cooperation with diversity. And that's what my EDI interventions try to do. Yes, if they tick the box, for diversity in the workplace I go great then I go but what are your small group work um, schedules like let me see who's working in the finance department and you'll see they're all culturally homogenous there's very little diversity there and then there's another group and there's another cultural group there but there's no intercultural groups working um, at these organizations and particularly at that middle high management level very little diversity there and that's where we need it to filter down Mm. What are some of the exemplars in, 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 in the research, whether through, you know, your research or, you know, others around the world that have shown to be, you know, really uh, efficacious in that, in the reduction, you know, model that we're talking about? I'm, I'm also just thinking about even just, uh, you know, cultural things that we do. I call it cultural because um, that's what it feels like. Um, you know, Canberra just celebrated its, Oh, I think it was the 25th year of multicultural festival and uh, you know from where it was humble beginnings to where it was you know just just a couple of weeks back you know they, they had something like 250,000 um you know attendees Fantastic. and you know every country that 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 wanted to participate you know was provided a stall and they can you know have their own food and you know they're given opportunities to do dances and you know singing and entertainment and 
um, I remember walking around, you know, with 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 my family, and you know, we we went to specific ones, like you know, we watched the Polish dancing, our Beautiful. heritage. We went to you know, Serbian stall to eat, you know, Serbian yeah. food, but we also went and watched, you know, uh, Indian singers and African yeah. dancers, and um, you know, singing and dancing from you know. Oh, all the cultures, because as yeah. you're walking around, you, you, I mean, you could specifically target some, but yeah. uh, you would just kind of feel these things in their stalls and, and obviously um, their, their traditional dress. Uh, and what's fascinating is that you know, no one, you, no one's in anyone's traditional dress. These are traditional dancing dresses or traditional yes. like wedding dresses or yes. something yes. or other. Yes. So we don't use, we don't wear this commonly no. anyway, no. but. No. have them around it's no. absolutely stunning and beautiful yeah. and it's just yeah. so rich and and there's yeah. lots of contact because yes. Yes. cultures are watching other cultures and celebrating their traditional dance or celebrating their traditional foods and you know yeah. um, there's a lot of mingling going on which is which which is beautiful you know and i don't know how someone would research that but obviously going back to the start what are some of the exemplars that that of of ways that we can do it you know on the ground that are you know, behaviorally focused, um, yep. or at least create behavioral um, and, and and cognitive change. You know, uh, uh, you know, change opinions. Well, like I said, in the prejudice reduction field, probably the leading approach is is all ports um, contact theory. But more recently, we have been experimenting with those conditions. And there was this great paper that came out in two thousand and eight, and then two thousand and nine. It was a meta analysis, and it was by um, Trop and uh, Pettigrew. And Thomas Pettigrew was actually Allport's PhD student and Linda Trop was actually Pettigrew's PhD student. So that was kind of the pedigree. And they ran this meta-analysis of like 70 years of contact research. And they found, Nish, that those studies that incorporated all of all four of con, all four of uh, all ports contact conditions actually impacted reduction more significantly than research that only used or operationalized one or two of the contact conditions. So it's clearly the case that if you can create intergroup contact that's cooperative, there's some equality or equal status. And what I can operationalize equal status as, I'll give you an exemplar of that, is they might be in the same grade in, in the classroom. Or well, they might be at the same managerial level at the workplace, or they might be in the same managerial team in the workplace. That could be an equal status way to operationalise it. Um, they might be the same gender. Uh, that might be another way of the, of the same age. So that's how you can kind of operationalise equal status. Cooperation is it has to be co a positive source of contact. They need to be achieving something together. So when you get these two groups together, give them a goal that they need to achieve, that they can't achieve alone. And that's really important, okay, and that's why the cooperation is so important. It's not about those groups being competitive and coming up with a solution. It's about cooperating to achieve something that you really needed to extract information from the other person in order to achieve that goal. And so that's the kind of dynamic that we need to have in place, whether it's in the school classroom, whether it's in the workplace, that is really an integrated diversity, a cooperative diversity with those four conditions. That would be my exemplar model. It's worked across lots of contexts that I've studied in e-contact. It's worked in reducing racial um, prejudice, sexism, um, mental health stigma. Uh, it's also helped with sexual minority um, prejudice and uh, lots of related religious prejudices. It's even been used in Turkey amongst um, Turks and Kurds who have a, a conflictual relationship. My e-contact paradigm has been used there. And it was the first time it was translated into language to suit the, 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 the participants in that, that research study. So, you know, it's, it's been kind of had this global impact because these four conditions, if you really carefully operationalise them, to suit the context that you're dealing with has this kind of robust global impact and that's what we've found. Is globalisation helping to, to accelerate this because we are requiring at least at some level a lot more cooperation between, you know, countries and, and, and that we, uh, you know, uh, uh, have much more 
access to things that have been achieved by these types of groups. I mean, capitalism in some sense, you know, goes out and says, can you create uh, a competitive environment where people are very diverse, you know, merit-based, you know, um, skill bases come together to, to compete against another group slash another company company to achieve something really you know, brilliant um, to then obviously put to market that we all use and, and, and so on. And, and there's many overlaps we kind of are, uh, you know, we're all reliant. We're certainly Australia and many countries. Well, I think all of us are reliant on every other country in some way, shape or form for the lives that we, we, we live. That's not fair. I shouldn't say every, but uh, many modern um, developed countries uh, our importing and all that does, does any of that help at all or is, is it a media thing that 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 is you know uh, uh, a source of problem or potentially a source of solution as to how we go out and talk about others yeah look i think globalization can be used in a more cooperative way um i think sometimes globalization the focus is on the end product you know what can we produce rather than the process of getting there. So it's more outcome focused. I'm really more interested in, in the process that it is more cooperative. It's yeah. there's more equal status, there's more um, acknowledgement. That you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas with globalization, yeah, there's different groups coming together. But you like you said, in that competitive competitive sphere, that's no good. Compet- competition is probably the worst thing for prejudice um, because it just exacerbates it. It gives powerful people more power and the people striving for power less power. So it's even creating that greater inequality uh, and lack of equality that we so need as one of the conditions for pressures to be reduced. Mm. I can see how it could so unfortunately, bring one group yeah. together. But unfortunately, yeah. as you're bringing one group together, you're actually introducing the us and them scenario. So it's, you know, Correct. we are better than them. And so Correct. once again, there's a, there's a new category built, you know, yeah. which yeah. is, yeah. Um, you know, part of this this whole issue. And it doesn't necessarily be need to be a cultural, religious, you know, gender, sexual difference. Right. It can yeah. be just a yeah. technical difference. You know, we're, we're smarter and better because we belong to this company. You know, and and you know what? Or, that will then reinforce the power niche and that will create the divide and make it even bigger. And I think um, the other other thing that I've talked I mean I've talked a lot about contact which is I think a social strategy but I must I'm a social cognitive psychologist so I also like cognitive interventions and some of the cognitive interventions I use to reduce prejudice are things like um, perspective taking so something you're very familiar with you know how would it be to walk in the shoes of a first nations person of course you know you have to give a scenario you've got to give a context You've got to have First Nations people consulted on your intervention. You've got to have First Nations people tell you what might be a useful perspective-taking um, scenario that they would find helpful as well. So a lot of my research, if it does involve First Nations, um, you know, really needs First Nations voices in that research. I'm very much an advocate of that. Um, but really the thing what I look at is a cognitive in- uh, strategy called recategorization. It's like a reframing. Um, so it's a cognitive technique where you, again, you ask someone again in an intergroup kind of situation, say it's Muslim and Christian again, um, that, you know, you are your individual Christian identity and you are your individual Muslim identity. So that's your single identity, but you have a second identity or a dual identity. And that's the, the recategorization framework. And it's something that connects both of you where you overlap. And that's when I use, you know, this environmental sustainability identity that you all have and live on this Australian environment. There's a part of an Australian identity in both of you. And that's your common or your second identity. And it's when you said us and them, it's really important in this cognitive recategorization strategy called dual identity, that these two groups, not just have their single identity, because I want them to retain them because different difference is really important in prejudice reduction but I also want them to have this kind of overlapping second identity which is you know the Australian environment in my example here that connects you because that second identity breaks down the us and them the second identity also kind of or what I call the subordinate identity also connects these two individual groups and it it kind of this recategorization changes the us and them into we you know we actually have something in common yes we're different 
but there's a commonality. And that's what I love about dual identity and that reframing. You're not us and them anymore. You're a we, but you're never asked mm. to relinquish who you are. Your, your individual identity is still important. You're just reframing and recreating the second shared identity. And that takes time. And that 10-week program, you know, it took the students about 10 weeks to get there. But as you know, any recategorization, reframing, any cognitive strategy really does take time. Um, so we need time to change the setup that we have of inequity and inequality. There's so much that, that can be said around you know, perspective taking in 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 that space, and I, I think time is important because it's not about one exposure. It's, you know, many contacts of perspective taking, and I know that j- just thinking about the act perspective, the acceptance commitment therapy perspective. Yeah. There's so much work, and other therapies do do similar things as well. But in terms of looking at, for example, uh, you know, this who are you, um, uh, 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 you know technique which you just continue to ask a client you know who are you and you ask Mm -hmm. them to uh, uh, um, respond with i am and then provide a role so it might be you know i am a father Mm -hmm. and then you ask who are you Mm -hmm. in in, in a very curious way again Mm -hmm. and they say well i'm a brother Mm -hmm. thank you Mm -hmm. who are you and then you just keep doing it. So you, you roll through many, many roles that someone holds, which might be, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm a psychologist, I'm a friend, you know, I'm a maintenance person at home, I am, um, you know, a, a, a contributor. Um, and then we might even go to, you know, other other sort of, you know, characteristics and the like. And eventually if you keep going, you you, you get to a point where you kind of just say, I've, I've run out of, of things, you know, and you mm. kind of, what's I am, mm. and and that's it, mm. uh, and 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 so there's there's a commonality that we all have an I am, and yeah. there's some some beauty around that. And there's other works of like Kelly Wilson, uh, which is one of the founders of ACT, that yeah. does a lot of work with perspective taking in mm. in therapy, which tries to put you behind the eyes of someone else Mm -hmm. so you know if you were able to kind of step out from behind yourself and Mm -hmm. go around and place yourself behind the eyes of you know your parent what -hmm. would they be feeling Mm -hmm. you know what would they be Mm -hmm. thinking Mm -hmm. if you were to place yourself behind the eyes of your younger self when you were 10 years old what Mm -hmm. were you thinking Mm -hmm. what were you feeling you know what what is it that you desired and yearned for in that moment? Or, you know, your, your, you know, friend, you know, your younger parents, how they were being raised. So all these perspective taking in, when you look at some of Kelly Wilson's and, 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 and others work, when you ask, you know, what, what's the sequence, you know, what should you be doing? The response is in actual fact, there is no sequence. It's because mm. we don't know what's going to stick. Mm. Uh, so, you know, you try and come with some sort of formulation and, and clinical, um, uh, uh, you know, consideration as to what perspective you're trying to take, but you take as many as you can because that's yeah. called variation, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, it's it's an important part of evolution to see which which one sticks, which one has an imprint. And then when you do find something that has a significant imprint, you stay as much time as you can in that to create contact, right, which yeah. is the exposure of the, the grief, the sadness, the the understanding, the vulnerability, the the um, you know the 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 sorrow that comes with that, or whatever it is that's there, and you know, from that position, obviously, some cognitive change can can occur, and it is quite powerful. So, mm. I love this idea of perspective taking, mm. and and you know, getting behind the eyes, and I don't know why, but that's got such a strong impression, and if it's delivered well it's like because you you're you're stepping into the person and seeing from their eyes you know it's a much more intimate way of trying to think about what someone else is thinking what someone else is feeling you know it's, it's so empathic um or it may well, it's actually even potentially sympathetic at that point uh, oh, cool. because you are kind of in them and you're feeling what they would feel so you know it's got power yeah, and, and if the minority or the targeted person is feeling sadness because they are the target, you might think, oh, I might be less 
I mean, might be more reluctant to be that negative toward them next time because that's how they're feeling. That's Absolutely. how I'm making them feel, you know. So it's a very useful tool alongside all of my little bag of tricks that have to be used together um, because this is such a difficult behaviour to change, like you said, because prejudice is so hardwired. You know, we're really undoing. I always say we're undoing or we're unlearning years and years of learnt associations of, you know, um, of prejudice. So that's really what we or what I identify as, as an unlearner of these negative associations. Um, and whatever tools I have, whether it be contact, perspective taking, dual identity recategorization, which are my main go-tos, that's what I'm going to use because I think perspective taking is really good too, Nesh, because in this issue of privilege, you know, we we talk about white privilege, right? So in this space, there's this idea that if you've never been a target of racism because you're white, um, you don't know what it feels like and therefore you can't um, um, help people with who or who might be because you just don't have that that walking in their shoes moment well here's where perspective taking might be a really good tool for people who've had white privilege and when I talk about privilege I'm not talking about monetary privilege or financial privilege white privilege is about being white and therefore never being a target of racism uh, and therefore never knowing what it feels like to to be left out because of the color of your skin so maybe yeah you know perspective taking probably won't fully get there but it's a, a step toward there. It's it's something that needs to probably happen at some level to to let these other strategies like contact and recategorization then also take take effect. So I think it's very much multi pronged. It's a it's mm. a complex attitude and behaviour, and so it's it's very much a multi pronged intervention. It's social, cognitive, emotion based. I think if it's integrated with with emotions, it can be very powerful. You know, the, mm. the whole concept of, you know, white privilege, if if we reframe that and, and ask anyone, any human being, you know, to think of a time when they were felt marginalised, that, that mm. they weren't in the in-group, you know. Right. I mean, that could be as simple as yeah. that exercise when, you know, we were as kids uh, selected which team we want to yeah. go on, you know, and, and the poor kids that were in the last two or three yeah. I mean, what an awful experience. Yeah. That is yeah. just terrible, right? And that, that and Nesh, they remember that forever. Absolutely. They, and, they and, talk about it as adults. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and sadly, uh it, it, it's true. Like if, if we're going to select on merit, right? There are some kids that are not going to hold as as higher merit in athletic ability. Mm. So they get mm. picked last, right? Mm -hmm. We need to kind of understand how those things affect, you know, kids and all of us, but we've all been marginalised at some point. I think mm. that reframing, you know, and, and, and looking at it, saying, you know, remembering a time when you've been marginalised and then what might, what that might be if you were marginalised as something you couldn't change, like, you know, the colour of your skin or your heritage or, you know, where what school you, you grew up in or mm. whatever it might be. It has great, great effect. Can I ask you, for, for some of our listeners who would like to, start thinking about um, you know introducing some of these concepts either in their in their own lives or maybe in a workplace or you know if they work in a school um, what are some of the toolkits so so you know uh, tool tools I suppose in your toolkit that you might be able to offer for at least for us to at least start to think about maybe then read more about as to how to apply that and and yeah. and you know what are some of the you know primary ones that, that obviously uh, and maybe you can give some examples of what you've done in the past in in, in certain scenarios sure. so that we can kind of go, how would I fit that or what could I do that's similar that has that that um, nuanced understanding about, you know, what was the sure. uh, efficacious part of, of that inter intervention? Would love to. So, Nish, what I'll, I'll give to the listeners is a link to the school that tried to end racism. It's, a, it's on iView now, ABC, freely distributed. It's a three-part docu-series um, and it gives all of the interventions that we uh, apply to that school. So a lot of teachers have looked at that. I also have a series of um, online articles related to, to that um, intervention. So not can they only visually see it. Parents, teachers can read these online 
articles. Again, freely available. The ABC has made it freely available to everyone, so very happy to share those links. Um, and it'll tell teachers and parents some strategies that they can include. And, you know, I even say some, something as simple as find out all of the parents, find out all the, the culturally or racial, racially or religiously different kids in the neighbourhood and, and see if you can meet up with them or have lunch at their place. Um, I remember having lunch at some of my uh, Italian friends' places when I was growing up um, in my suburb because that was kind of um, the ethnicity that was around. I also had a lot of Lebanese friends. Um, and so food was was a really good point of contact and um, achieving things together. We used to cook together, pastas and little things like that. Parents might think, oh, you know, they already do that, but be a bit more, you know, aware, like cognitively aware, have more agency about looking for opportunities for your kids to have contact and then also for, for parents to have intercultural, interracial, interreligious contact amongst their friends. Mm. I, I have a little um, Venn diagram that says, this is your friendship circle and, and list all the different cultures that you have in your friendship circle from close friend to acquaintance. And it's interesting what comes up there because it makes you self-reflect and think, wow, most of my intercultural friends are really just acquaintances. I don't really have many close by. And and that kind of little exercise, that tool might be helpful tool too. It's called the friendship circle. So, again, it's kind of this friendship circle that really is a self-reflection of your level of intergroup contact that you might have um, around you as a parent but also your, 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 your children might have. It's so powerful. I'm just thinking right now my my children's school is is putting on, I don't even know what they call it, but it might be like an international day or something and yeah. every family can come along or they can um, contribute a plate. Uh, and so the idea is obviously, you know, once again, contact of culture, right. um, and uh, you know, it's a uh, it's something they do each year. And you know, when I just think about all these little things, how powerful they are um, in that this is being promoted, uh, you know, through schools. Um, you know, none of us are thinking about this, but I'm sure whoever put this together did. Um, yeah. And that it just creates this this you know nice sort of. Uh, uh, cooking pot of, of exposure, you know, through food. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what what comes with food is everything else. Um, the conversation, but, yeah, the ensuing conversation. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's funny. Food in particular does it. Maybe that's why this multicultural festival is yes. such a big thing. Yes. I, I remember when I was a kid, I went <laughs> uh, one of the first times to a friend's home and and uh, they had me over for dinner and, and I almost, you know, fell off my chair, you know, uh, so to speak. Because they they serve the food on a plate and brought it to the the uh, table and that was that and I was like this is such a foreign world like where are all the you know pots and 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 um, yes. containers of food yes. like enough to eat for you know four families yes. 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 Um, and you know mum putting more and more and yes. more on yes. And yes. it was it was such a different experience I know. Um, and you know I thought it was weird and you know thinking. You know, talking with my parents, they would be shocked at the idea of serving, you know, canapes at a, yes. at an event, you know, because yes. it's got to be this huge spread. But yeah. you know, when they've been to events where there's canapes, they're like, you know, maybe we're the dumb ones, you know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe what we do is a bit silly because you spend all day in the kitchen. Yeah, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, yeah. yeah, this is that cross contact, and, yes. and it's not that they then abandon by any no, stretch of imagination no. their own. It's just like they just see a different perspective. It's like, yeah, yeah all of it's nice in its own yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there's something beautiful about you know each of those, and obviously, you know, there are pros and cons and so on. But being able to observe them all. Uh, is beautiful so I, I love that and that would be wonderful if you could share that obviously with with with, with our listeners and we'll put it up on our website so there's yeah. plenty of links anywhere else that we can find out more about you know your work how to get in yeah. touch yeah please um, I'll, i'm going to i'll put up my contact details for my sydney university so i'm a professor at sydney university so i'll put up that website i also have a lab, a research lab called the sydney university psychology of intergroup relations lab but when you cut it down it's called super s-u-p-i-r lab so super <laughs> lab and um it has all of my publications there it has all of the work that we're doing all of my media releases um all of my impact um outside university 
Um, I mean, I've got research consultancy. So a lot of people call me up and say, can you come and work in the school? Can you come and work in my organisation? We have diversity issues in the organisation. Um, so I do lots of that work outside university as well. So I'll put some links up. But my email, of course, Sydney University email is the best place to call me and contact me and then we take it from there, Nish. Fiona, thank you so much for, for, for today. One of the things that really jumps out at me is, is uh, how passionate you are about this space of, you know, promoting you know, you know, equity, diversity, inclusion, but in, in, in a different way, you know, you're not trying to advocate for a group or, or push an agenda. You're, you're kind of saying, you know, as a human uh, community race, you know, um, human beings, how do we go out and, and cross paths more often, you know, and, and it doesn't matter who's crossing paths with who. It's just yeah. let, let's do as much contact as we can, have goal-orientated, um, you know, uh, activities to do. If we can do it cooperatively and the like, we we can then un- appreciate and understand through the process. You know, these, these are process-based experiences. Through that, we can learn more about each other and break down these, these, these issues, which I think is far superior than going out and, you know, carrying a particular flag and saying, yeah. you know, treat us with respect. It's like, yeah. you know, if we can get out and, and, and yeah. connect with others, we will naturally be treated with respect because yeah. people can't go out and argue that yeah. we bring kindness and, 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 and everything yeah. else that everyone else does. We're not different because of our, you know, yeah. Uh, skin hair age yeah. you know um yeah. sexuality whatever it might be yeah. we're all we're all just uh this this common common thing called human so Correct. thank you so much fiona it's so refreshing and and uh you know really really warms my heart love talking with you nesh and thank you for the opportunity and like if we can make one person's life better from listening to this then we've achieved something so that's great keep doing your amazing work i appreciate you so much and take care Thanks, Nish. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.